I don't think I have to tell you this, but uh, I will. Um, God is just doing so many good things here at Highland, and um, I was just thinking about that uh, a little earlier this morning, just kind of praising the Lord for what He's doing, and um, just just recently, um, you know, we're, we had women uh, that went to a women's conference this weekend, and they got back, and I know they had a delightful and encouraging time. Um, the fact that uh, Elijah Torres, I don't know if Elijah's in here, um, but do it. Oh, not, not here, okay. Um, but uh, he scored superior uh, on, on Saturday at uh, the state Bible drills competition. And so, uh, um, yeah, praise the Lord for him. His dad, Michael Torres, uh, uh, God's been really dealing with him. If you remember back in uh, August, uh, we licensed uh, Michael uh, to the ministry. Um, and we get to see, hopefully, uh, Lord willing, um, his ordination happen before God calls him to a uh, place of service in ministry. And so uh, if you are an ordained uh, 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 minister of the gospel, um, then we're going to have his ordination council next Sunday afternoon at 4 p.m. Uh, in the, uh, uh, here at the church, probably the tea room areas where we normally have that, but um, you'll be given more information about that. But just put that on your calendar. If that's you, uh, if you f- uh, fit that, we want you to be a part of uh, his ordination council. And then uh, the next Sunday, uh, we will uh, look at, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, later in May, we'll have his ordination service. Uh, so God's doing great things there. The fact that we are you know, having our second gathering service coming up, and the first one we had was about, I think it was around around 70 people, half the people did not uh, attend here, half did. And so uh, we're looking forward to that and more and more people coming for that. Uh, this is just a unique service that is offered for people that may or may not be able to get here on Sunday morning. Um, and so that's just becoming a more unique way to reach people uh, that we're seeing God use. Um, and then uh, I, I can't help but mention these though. Man, in the last two weeks, God has been so good because we've seen God miraculously heal um, a, young, a, a young lady um, to go from no hope at all to uh, speaking, getting a room soon, and um, that's been pretty big. And then bigger than that, bigger than that, there's been three people within the last week that have been literally snatched from the fires of hell and God has saved this past week. And so, can we give God praise for that? God is absolutely good. And we need those good things to balance out some of the difficult things that we need to address. Um, We are in a series called The Six Hard Sayings of Jesus. There's a lot more hard sayings of Jesus. I just chose six. Um, Hopefully, Uh, following God's spirit and direction. Um, And today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. And as you're turning to Matthew chapter 5 in this this particular section, let me just start with the question, who likes magic? And that's not a trick question like you're going to raise your hand and like, "Ah, come down and repent. No. Um, (laughs) I mean, who likes watching magic shows? Yeah. I grew up watching that. I mean, uh, I remember when David Copperfield came to the Temple Theater. Y'all remember that, right? Some of y'all did. Um, Or if you're of the newer generation, maybe it's more David Blaine, or there's probably somebody newer than him now. Um, If you're in the older generation, maybe you you remember Houdini. I'm kidding. You don't remember that. But this idea of, you know, magicians and magic, it's the whole point is to create an illusion and to trick you or me into seeing something that is actually not real. Like there's not the real aspect. These, these men and women, they don't really have powers beyond ours. They use illusion to create a false sense of reality. So you may like magic, but I think what I like better than that is, do you like watching how magic tricks are revealed? <laughs> I, 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 I like that. Yeah, because I get to see, hey, they're really not much different than me, right? They can, you know, use sleight of hand, they're a little quick with their their hands, and they're creative and all that. But what that does is, when the trick is revealed, the magician is seen as a fake, right? As a charlatan. We see the inner workings of this person. 
Last week's hard saying was in Matthew 19 that, you know, the camel through the eye of a needle. It's easier for us to take a camel and to get it through an eye of a literal needle than it is for someone who is not willing to give up everything and follow Jesus. It's easier for us to take a camel and get through the eye of a needle than it is for that person to have eternal life, to be saved, to be in God's kingdom, if they're not willing to turn their back on the world. We know that, right? We get that. But so many people sit in church year after year after year and they do the same thing because they're relying on other things, church membership, giving, all these other things to check the box, but yet they've never had an actual real heart transformation. This week, we're going to go back to Matthew 5 and look at this saying in Matthew 5 verse 20 that heaven, eternal life, salvation is impossible if you're not more righteous than the religious elite. Unless you are more righteous than the religious elite of Jesus' day, you and I are never going to see the kingdom of heaven. You and I will never be saved. You and I will never have eternal life. According to Jesus, look at chapter 5 verse 20. This is in the middle of the, or the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' famous sermon, longest recorded sermon. And here he says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Not you may get into the kingdom of heaven. Not you can get really close and then maybe on a good day, if, God's, if he's in a good mood, then you'll get in the kingdom of heaven. He says you'll never get into the kingdom of heaven unless your righteousness surpasses those that were the most righteous of Jesus' day. Now, this is a hard saying because when Jesus' disciples, when the crowd that had gathered to hear this teacher would have heard this, you would have seen literal mouths drop. What in the world? The question would be, how in the world are we supposed to be saved if we have to be better than these guys? That's the hard saying that we're dealing with today, is that Jesus is going to reveal, like the magician that's being revealed, Jesus is going to reveal the true nature of the scribes and the Pharisees. As he reveals this, they are masters of manipulation. They're masters of an illusion that they have portrayed so that everybody puts them on these high pedestals. And yet Jesus is going to reveal that to bring them down off that pedestal and to reveal the true heart and the nature of these scribes and Pharisees. And then warn us what the real matter of the heart is or the heart of the matter. And so you can go fast forward to Matthew 23. Jesus talks about the, the heart of the scribes and the Pharisees. He calls them whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. They look pretty on the outside, but they're dead and decaying on the inside. He calls them a dirty cup, that the cup is shiny on the outside, but inside it's just nasty and full of junk. This is the heart of the scribes and the Pharisees. If you don't know who those are, these were the rock stars of Jesus' day. Really, everybody wanted to be these guys. They're often found together, scribes and Pharisees. The scribes were guys who knew the law, the Old Testament law, better than anyone. They knew it better than anyone. They studied it more than anyone. You could ask them any question on any part of the law and they would be able to give you an answer. They knew the law better than anyone. And the Pharisees practiced the law better than anyone. Both the Torah, the written law, they practiced it to a T, or they tried. And the oral law, the one that had built up over hundreds of years, they practiced that too just so that they wouldn't break any of the laws that would get them to the, the, the Ten Commandment part. So they filled up all these things. So these were literally the rock stars of Jesus' day, the super spiritual elite. And yet Jesus says, they're just external righteousness, and it only ends in destruction. Last week we made this statement that said, salvation is not transactional, it's transformational. These guys were all about transactional. If I do this and this and this and this, therefore the result is God does this, this, this. 
And Jesus here is saying, you're just dead on the inside. Salvation is not transactional, but it is transformational. So this week's hard saying of Jesus helps us understand how to live in the kingdom of God. And we start with the heart exam. So the bulk of the message is all going to be Jesus' diagnostic or heart healthy diagnostic. If you've ever had a heart exam or all, you know, if you ever went to the hospital complaining of chest pains, they put you through all these, you know, uh, this routine because it's that serious. Well, it's even more serious, Jesus says, when it comes to our spiritual heart, that we have to really take an introspective look at our hearts. Don't allow yourself to think, well, I've been at this church this long, so this doesn't apply to me. I haven't been a Christian for this long. This doesn't apply to me. Or I do this over here, and this doesn't apply to me. It all applies to every one of us. And so in a really quick way, there's five heart attitudes that should be in change. They should be changing if you and I are in the kingdom of God. Number one, are you allowing hatred to live in your heart? Are you allowing hatred to live in your heart? Look at verses 21 through 26. Jesus goes on, he says, You have heard that it was said to our ancestors, Do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Whoever insults his brother or sister will be subject to the court. Whoever says, You fool, will be subject to hellfire. So if you're offering your gift on the altar and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on the way with him to the court or your adversary will hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you will be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will never get out of there until you have paid the last penny. So Jesus here at the beginning, verse 21, he says, you've heard that it said, by the way, he says six times through here, you have heard that it is said, and then he's going to say, but I tell you, so just know that Jesus from the very beginning is putting himself on the par of God. He's saying in the Old Testament, God said this, but I'm telling you this now. He's not saying it's, it's bad. He's not saying that it's obsolete. But he is coming to fulfill the law. And just because, or because he is God, he can reinterpret the law. He can give a new law. And so he does. He says, but you have heard that it is said, do not murder, sixth commandment. But I tell you, then he's going to go on. Jesus uses escalating language in here. You know, if you look through that, he says, anger is subject to judgment, insulting a brother is subject to the court, that's the Sanhedrin, and you fool is subject to hellfire. What does he mean? The escalation of this is that if you don't check your anger, if I don't check my anger, it can, be, it can lead to judgment. If I were to uh, say something in a just terrible way to you because I'm angry at you, well, I may get punched in the face. That's a judgment. And that's what Jesus is saying. He says, you need to check your anger because it will lead to someone executing judgment on you. Now, he's not talking about what the other person did. He's talking about us, right? Our own heart. And then he says, but if you insult someone in the Jewish community, which they live in an honor-shame society, that is terrible to bring an insult to someone. You may even be kicked out of the worshiping community. The Sanhedrin may actually kick you out of the temple worship and the synagogue worship. You may not be able to be a practicing Jew anymore. And then if it keeps going, you say you fool. We don't really know exactly what he means, raka, but whatever it means, it was bad enough that it may lead you to hell. That's what Jesus is saying, this escalation of our anger. So here's how the scribes were getting around it. The Pharisees, they were getting around it. They would not go around saying, or they would not be, uh, dare be caught murdering someone. That's, you know, penalty by death, capital punishment. They would not premeditate how they can get back at someone like that. 
But you remember the part where he's talking about leave your gift and then go to the person who has something against you? Not you've done something to the other person, but somebody has something against you and maybe you're angry at them. Maybe they don't have a right to be, you know, to have something against you. Maybe you get all defensive. Jesus says you need to leave your gift at the altar before you worship and go take care of that. Be reconciled to that person. So what they were doing was they, they weren't murdering people. They were trying to get back at people like that. But man, they, they held this hatred in their heart toward people. If you don't believe me, just think about how they felt about Jesus. They didn't like him. They wanted to kill him, but they were going to keep their hands clean, right? And Jesus says, you know what? It's not about the act. It's about it originates in your heart. That if you and I don't keep murder or anger unchecked, it will eventually lead to our destruction. None of us are probably going to say, you know, I really wish that person that cut me off into traffic, I can't wait till I find them so I can kill them. But if that person that cut me off in traffic happens to hit a bus doing that and gets killed, well, that's on them. Anger in our heart, Jesus says. It has to be checked. So in your heart exam, what does it reveal? Is there a point in your life or right now that your attitude toward anger is changing our let our anger left unchecked it can lead us into sin and judgment and earthly courts as good as they are they cannot judge what they cannot see they cannot judge our inner thoughts but guess what god can and one day we are going to give an account for everything that we think say and do including the way in which we felt about other people that have wronged us what is your attitude toward anger? Are you okay with it because no one knows about it? You may not have the outbursts of anger that lead to something physical, but Jesus says that anger comes from our hearts. Are you allowing God to change your heart in regards to anger? This is partly what it means to be saved and to live in the kingdom of God. Number two, <clears throat> are you allowing lust to reside in your heart? Are you allowing lust to reside in your heart? This comes in two parts. We're going to pick up with part A first, which is 27 through 30. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. So here Jesus goes back to the commandments. You see what he's doing, right? He, even though Matthew 19, Luke puts that later, and it probably does come later with the rich young ruler. How did he give the diagnostic to the rich young ruler? It was through the neighboring laws, right? The, the second half of the Ten Commandments. Guess what Jesus is doing with them? He's doing the same thing. He's giving them the commandments that are easy for us to see if we're actually doing them. And so here he picks the seventh commandment, which is also in Jewish law punishable by death, adultery. In adultery, if you're confused about that, it's having a sexual relationship with someone other than your spouse, including but not limited to fantasizing about someone who is not your spouse and having an inappropriate emotional connection that only belongs with your spouse. And it can even be said, listen to this married couples, it can even be said that if you treat your spouse as an object for gratification, you can actually be guilty of adultery in that way too. That hits home a lot different, doesn't it? So this is very serious because it begins in the heart, Jesus says. And he points back to the seventh commandment and Jesus goes straight to the source. It's the heart. I love the way the Revised Standard Version puts this in verse 29 about the eyes. It just says, don't let your eyes lead you into sin. It, it captivates our heart because we live in a culture that everywhere you turn, there are images, there are suggestions, innuendos, it's all over the place. 
And it's so easy to just gaze too long, to look too long, to be drawn in. And Jesus says, don't let your eyes lead you into sin. Lust begins in the eyes. Think about Adam and Eve, Genesis 3, 6. The woman saw, and now the fruit looked good. Or 2 Samuel eleven two. 2, David saw a beautiful woman bathing. Jesus uses figurative language, not literal. Please don't go gouge your eye out. Don't go cut your hand off. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's using figurative language to talk about the seriousness of your soul. He uses the right eye, the most important one in Jesus' day. The right hand, the most important one of Jesus' day. He's saying, if those things, you need to know the value of your soul. You need to know that you can't gaze too long. You need to look away. You need to run. You need to flee, as Paul says, from sexual immorality. Don't harbor it. Don't, don't be with it too long. Get it away. Jesus uses this figurative language to talk about the seriousness of our soul and of lust. And then to apply it, he uses this next part in 31 and 32. Look there with me. He says, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a written notice of divorce. But I tell you, everyone who divorces his wife, except in a case of sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. This is obviously a very sticky and highly contested passage of Scripture. And there are other passages that we could talk about divorce. We don't have time today, okay? But I want you to see why Jesus brings this up at this moment. Because it has to do with what he just talked about in that part A. There are two thoughts during Jesus' day from other rabbis that were around the time of Jesus. One of the rabbis, Rabbi Shimei, he said that his writings talked about that you could only divorce a woman because you found her to not be a virgin on your wedding night. Therefore, you can div divorce her. There were other punishable acts according to the Mosaic law, but the person could issue a certificate of divorce because of that, because of sexual immorality. The second one, Rabbi Hillel, was much more liberal. He said you could write a certificate of divorce from your wife based on anything, literally anything. She gained too much weight, boom, divorced. I'm not kidding. <laughs> she didn't cook good, see ya, divorce. You didn't like something about her, she annoyed you, she put the toilet paper the wrong way, divorce. That's how crazy it had gotten. And Jesus, in a way, is, yes, he is sort of siding with the Rabbi Shimei, but he goes even deeper than that. He reinterprets what the point is. See, the point is the scribes and the Pharisees, because they're only concerned with the outward appearance, they're only concerned about the external righteousness, they would marry a lady and then divorce her for any reason and then remarry. And Jesus here is calling out their lust. They technically were getting around adultery by use of divorce, but Jesus goes to the heart of the matter, says you can't do that. You need to deal with the heart of the matter. So how do Christians battle lust? Well, Psalm 119.9 is a great verse to begin with. How can a young man or person in general keep his way or her way pure? By living according to your word. Or as Paul said to Timothy, flee sexual immorality. Lust is an empty promise. It will never satisfy. And so instead of lusting after someone... God wants us to long for a deeper relationship that, that satisfaction can only be found in Him, in that personal relationship with Him. So instead of lusting next time, long, lean into your relationship with Jesus. What happens if you fall to lust? Proverbs 24, 16. Though a righteous person falls seven times, he will get up. We won't be perfect on this side of eternity. There are times where you will fall to this, but you get back up. 
You keep following Jesus. You put your eyes on the author and the perfecter of our faith. You long for a deeper relationship. You lean into that deeper relationship. You get back up. So the question here of our heart diagnostic is, are you fighting against lust in your heart? Are you loving your spouse the way that God wants you to love them? Number three, are you becoming a more truthful person? Are you becoming a more truthful person? Verse 33, again, you have heard that it was said to our ancestors, you must not break your oath, but you must keep your oaths to the Lord. But I tell you, don't take an oath at all, either by heaven because it is God's throne or by the earth because it is his footstool or by Jerusalem because it is the city of the great king. Do not swear by your head because you cannot make a single hair white or black, but let your yes be, mean yes and your no mean no. Anything more than this is from the evil one. So again, Jesus going back to the commandments, the 10, he goes to the third commandment, do not take the Lord your God's name in vain. So originally, that meant to do not swear by God's name. Don't use God's name as a weight so that others will know you're telling the truth. Later, it would become, it morphed into don't use his name as a curse word or in any irreverent, ir, uh, irrespective way. But here, what Jesus is getting at is that he's saying you don't have to swear by anything. You don't need to use other things to bring weight to your words, to your yes and no. People should believe you because you're a truthful person. You don't need to call heaven and earth to bear witness to you because they're not yours to call anyway. They're God's. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. His followers should be so full of the truth that we do not need extra validation or weight like a vow or an oath or swearing that we are telling the truth. We should not only tell the truth, but we should tell the truth because we are people of the truth. How many times do we use the story of the boy who cried wolf to teach our kids to tell the truth? But how many times do we battle telling the truth as adults? Are we growing as a truthful person? Do people know you as a person of truth? What would they say of the things that you share on social media? Is it the truth? Or from your you know, particular news source, is it the truth? What do you speak about others? Is it the truth? What do you speak about our church? Is it the truth? Truth begins in the heart. And God wants to transform that. He wants to continue changing that so that it reflects Christ, who is the truth. So is that happening in your life? Number four, are you treating others better than they deserve? Are you treating others better than they deserve? Verse 38, let's pick up there. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, don't resist an evildoer. On the contrary, if anyone slaps you on your right cheek, turn, to the other, turn the other to him also. As for the one who wants to sue you and take away your shirt, let him have your coat as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who asks you and don't turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. There's a lot of uh, cultural things that we could say about that. You probably know some of those. You could research some of those for yourself. But I just want to deal with the heart of the matter here, of what Jesus is getting at. He brings up eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. That is Exodus 21, 24, the law of retaliation. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But again, Jesus says, but I tell you, don't, and this is the summary of what he's saying, don't let retaliation be your first response. You see, our culture says that we are to do to others what they did to us. We grow up learning that as kids, believing that, knowing that. You know, he stole something from me, I'm gonna take something from him. He hit me, I'm gonna hit him. He bit me, I'm gonna bite him. I mean, that's just the way our sin nature works. And Jesus, though, here says, we as his people living in the kingdom of God, being transformed day by day, are actually to treat others better than they deserve. So he gives the idea of the cheek, give them the other side too, the cloak. Don't just go one mile, go two. Treat others better than they deserve. 
I'm not sure Jesus, I don't, I don't think, uh, well, I don't, I don't think Jesus would uh, really uh, agree with like, you know, movies, movies like, you know, Liam Neeson and Taken, right? Or something like that. It's just always, you know, I don't think he wants us to pick up the phone and say, I know who you are. <laughs> you know, I know where you live. I have a very specific set of skills or whatever, but <laughs> although we would want to do that, I don't believe Jesus is ta- teaching passivity here, but he is absolutely concerned with the attitudes that are buried deep within our heart to want to fight for our own personal vindication. And yet we know that vengeance is mine, says the Lord. We are trusting that God will take care of what he needs to take care of in his timing. And that's not me, or that's not mine to take over. So what did Jesus do? Well, I mean, he treated his enemies surely better than they deserved. He washed Judas' feet knowing that Judas was just about to betray him. And more than that, he was crucified for you and me who rebelled against him, who did not want him. Jesus is the, the, the example setter in all of these things. And he wants to change our heart to be growing more like him in how we treat others. Number five, last one. Are you learning to love more like Jesus? Are you learning to love more like Jesus? Let's look at the last part, 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So Jesus, again, calls from the Old Testament. Leviticus 19 and 18, or 19, 18, the scribes, the Pharisees would have known this by heart, could say it in their sleep, love your neighbor, as yourself. And then he says, he adds to that what culture had tacked onto that. Hate your enemy. Love your neighbor. Hate your enemy. What to them it meant, love the Jew that is like you. Hate everybody else that's against that. And Jesus says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus' kingdom is a countercultural kingdom. It's an upside down kingdom filled with people that are heading in the opposite direction of where the world is heading. This kind of love that Jesus is talking about and this kind of action to pray instead of hate is supernatural. And it begins in a heart that is being transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you remember the, 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 the account of Paul, he was a persecutor of the church. He killed them. He arrested them. He imprisoned them. And I can't help but wonder, we don't have this in our text, but I cannot help but wonder if there were not people in the Jerusalem church remembering Jesus' words and praying for Paul, their great persecutor. And Jesus responds, what would happen if you and I prayed more than we complained about the problem people in our lives? Was Jesus not praying for us? He says, be perfect. That's his standard. He doesn't lower his standard. He always raises it. Being perfect like our Heavenly Father is only possible because Christ is at work in us. Now, will we be perfect? No. Is the standard perfection? Absolutely. Why? Because it reflects Jesus. Isn't that who we're supposed to be reflecting in our attitudes, in our actions, in what we think, say, and do? Sure it is. Only a heart that is being transformed by Jesus can reflect Jesus. Rick Warren, in his really famous book, The Purpose Driven Life, he has a line in there that says this, the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. The heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. No matter what's going on in your life, no matter who is making your life difficult, no matter what the circumstances of your life may be, 
That is not the central key figure of your life. Your heart is. The heart, the matter of the, the heart of the matter is a matter of your heart. And so where does your heart stand with Jesus right now? Have you come into a real relationship with him? It may not look like you want it to look, but can you say, Jesus really does have my heart. He has my life. And I, I know that I am not the person that I want to be, but I'm sure thankful I'm not the person I used to be. Can you really say that? When you did that heart exam, has there been a change in your heart? Can you look back and see God changing you along the way? More than that, would your spouse be able to say, I have seen a change in your heart the longer we live together? A change for the good, by the way. Can your kids say, I see a change in my dad's heart or in my mom's heart? Could your coworker say, I have seen a change in you over the, over the years? It's one thing of what we say, but what, does other what would other people say about our heart change? Could they say, you've had a heart change? Or are you just hiding like you've always done what's inside behind looking good on the outside? Are you trying to fool everyone into thinking that you're better off spiritually than you really are? You absolutely may fool us, but you can't fool God. He sees your heart. He knows where you stand with him. And he is calling you to himself today. If you will acknowledge your sin, if you'll turn from that and turn to him, he'll save you. He'll restore you. He'll give you a new heart. One that would want to do what he is calling you to do. One that is daily being changed by him. I pray that that is going to be true of you today. We're going to have a time of response. Abby, go ahead and come on up. If there is a response or a decision that you would like to make, that you know God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you, and you need to trust Him, you need to move, you need to get out of that seat, out of that pew, and you need to take care of that this morning, we're going to worship and respond because of who God is and what He's done this morning. Part of your worship is you need to come forward and get that settled with God. I'm going to be down front here to speak with you, to pray with you, to counsel with you, however that is. But may God receive glory and honor by how we respond. Let's stand and respond.